paper on uh, the title Commutational Suddenness uh, for Delvic Bytecode, uh, which is about uh, 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 which is about a very challenging problem in information flow control analysis about how to analyze in the crypto function functions. Hope I describe it correctly. Uh, so uh, let's start. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, let me dive into the topic. We all know that mobile apps can access our most private data, so there's a need to verify these apps. And Android has the biggest market share so far with 87.6% in second quarter of 2016. So um, many tools work on uh, Dalvik bytecode. However, um, these tools typically have a problem with capturing crypto. Typically they make an over approximation and are sufficiently precise if crypto operations are involved. And that's where our work starts. So um, we do not um, build a system, but we go uh, do work on one, does this one step earlier. We devise a um, Dalvik symbolic um, small step semantics that is amenable to automated verification tools. What do I mean with small step semantics? I mean basically the execution tree, so step by step. We internalize the attacker also step by step. And I will, I will make that more precise in a few minutes, just to give you an idea. And because we only change how the um, execution is viewed, we do not require any changes in the code. We want to basically um, do two things. We want to abstract the attacker in a symbolic way. I will explain to you what that means. And we want to abstract the cryptography. So we cut out all steps that belong to crypto and replace them with something else. Everything else should remain the same. So, should remain the same. so whenever there's no crypto involved, the program should do exactly the same thing in our symbolic variant of the execution as in the normal execution. And in particular, we want our um, abstraction to be faithful in the sense that it preserves security. I will talk more about what that means right now. What do we mean with security? There seem to be problems. Anyway. But can we try out your adapter? I'm sorry, this never happened with the adapter before. OK, so we want to preserve security. And what does that mean? Security, in our sense, is basically what the cryptographers consider as secure. We, if you consider the scenario where, on the left side, we have the honest, honest user, and you have a crypto library that the honest user calls. On the other side, you have the attacker. Then we. Um, the attacker is modeled as a Turing machine, as an interactive, polytime bounded probabilistic Turing machine. And the user, for example, queries the crypto library and says, please encrypt a message M for me. The crypto library outputs the message as a jumbled uh, bits of strings. And if all of the left side is basically the program which we param parameterize by M, then the sense of security that we want to define is computational indistinguishability. We say two programs, or in this case, the same program with two different messages, are computationally indistinguishable if this Turing machine cannot determine with, whether it's uh, talking to the program with message M1 or with programs with the same program with another message. So that's the security notion we want to aim at. And we would like to abstract this setting in order to make it amenable to formal verification methods. And what we do is we basically replace the crypto library with a symbolic library. And um, the symbolic library does not output a jumbled um, bit string, basically. 
it's it outputs symbols. Enc here is just a function symbol, and the message is there in plain text. And that's okay because the attacker is now not a Turing machine, it's the set of rules, and these rules can be applied to, to the uh, terms that come out. The terms are these symbolic things, the encryption. The terms are constructed out of uh, three different parts, basically. Fresh names, um, constructors, which are these uninterpreted function symbols, and destructors, which you can, say, you can see here, destructors are basically functions on um, terms. And you can describe them with symbolic rules. You can see here that I wrote the destructors on the attacker side, the constructors on the protocol side, but that's pure random. Both can use constructors and destructors. And if we now abstract the attacker in this way, we of course have to take care that um, we capture all possible attacks. So if the crypto that we use has some weaknesses, we have to model these weaknesses explicitly. And what we do is basically, if we have an Algamal encryption as an example, we have to give the attacker the capability to decrypt, even though uh, if he only has the uh, randomness with which the ciphertext was produced. Okay. Um, now we have, want to have a notion of security in this symbolic world. What we do is we define the set of terms as all symbols that are generated by constructors, destructors, and these nonces. Then we define the attacker knowledge based on, a, on the trace of messages that you receive and send, basically the messages in HM plus the messages in M. And the knowledge are all terms and test results derivable from nested applications of these symbolic rules um, to the trace. And symbolic equivalence basically means if you only take the yes-no questions, the yes-no tests that you can do with these symbol symbolic rules, then um, the yes-no tests have the same results if you apply them for P1 or P2. That's the symbolic notion of security, and that's what you call symbolic equivalence. In our sense, that's basically trace equivalence for those who work in, with these things. So computational soundness is what we consider faithful. What I call faithful is also called computational soundness, and it means if we have symbolic equivalence of two programs, we also have computational indistinguishability of two programs. Let me take a bird's eye view of how our result works and where we work on. So we work with the COSP framework, and the COSP framework basically gives you these symbolic models that I showed you and um, defines the computational attacker. And it also has its own notion of a program and so on. And the programming language, that's now the part that we are uh, concerned about in this work, the programming language is basically embedded into this COSP framework. That's what we do in this work. We take the Dalvik semantics, we get a symbolic model from the COSP framework. So our result is basically parametric in the symbolic model. And now we give you a symbolic variant of Dalvik that is computationally sound via this commuting diagram. So if you uh, didn't get that, it's only to give you a bird's eye view. Let's go back. Um, we want a symbolic variant of the Dalvik bytecode that considers the attacker as a set of rules, that um, has symbolic abstractions whenever crypto is used, and that's parametric in the symbolic model and has computational soundness. Okay, what, are, what is such a symbolic variant good for? Um, just to give you an idea why we do that. So you can use this as basically a specification for the cryptography that you're using. You can use it in contract-based verification. Daphne or Verifast do that. Bart Jacobs had a very nice work where he used crypto specifications recently. Um, you can use it in symbolic protocol provers like Proverif, Tamarin, Apte, Akis. Um, they are really useful for specifications, but you can also probably utilize them in a different way. You can use it in symbolic execution for testing methods, and there they're useful to make input generation for network messages, because the attacker in the symbolic model can be represented as very, very concisely with a few rules. So how does our um, computational indistinguishability look like for Dalvik? That's something that we have to go through. I'll try to make it quick. Dalvik itself is a register-based language. Probably most of you know it has a heap, it has program counter, it has function frames. And um, a configuration in Dalvik semantics basically yeah, has a stack of 
um, codes, a heap, a stack of program counters, and a stack of registers. These are the function frames, these stacks. And um, we would like to have a small step semantics for Dalvik. And what we took was work by Lords and, uh, and others, Stefan Lords. Um, and at the time of writing, this was the most detailed one we could find. It has parameterized instructions and um, got down to 52 instructions. But it does not include concurrency, exceptions, or reflections. And we inherit those weaknesses, those limitations. But our result is independent of these things, as you might see in a minute. So um, just to give you an example how this small step semantic works, um, this has to be read, uh, this, these diagrams have to be read if you don't know them, as this implies, oh sorry, if we have a configuration S, which is basically this one, and this holds, then this is the following configuration. This is how these executions work. So if, we, um, if the program counter points to, if the next Instruction basically is an invoke static instruction. This means invoke a static function. Then you have five um, arguments, and you have the method ID. You basically look up the method ID, uh, you look up the code with a method ID, and use the code M in the new function frame. You leave the heap H untouched, and you build the uh, program counter in the new function frame zero, and the, the default the registers um, inherit the values of the parameters. Okay. So we need to extend ADL. We need crypto, so we need probabilistic transitions, and we introduce a um, random, random instruction where you draw randomness. This is needed for the crypto libraries. We need asymptotic security, and we do that by um, considering a program that we have at hand as an instance of a family of um, programs that are all indexed by a security parameter, just to get the formalisms right here. And the attacker that we consider is an external attacker. So it's external of the device. And we model them as a set of malicious things. This means a set of function where we say the attacker is now executed, like send something over a TCP socket. The, attacker, the computation model for the attacker that we consider is a probabilistic transition system. This includes also Turing machines. Because we don't have concurrency, we have to extend the semantics and keep track of the attacker because we want to call him in between. And how we do it is pretty straightforward. Whenever you in, uh, encounter an invoke static method uh, instruction and the method ID is in the list of malicious things that the user has to specify, then you basically run the attacker, give him as input the parameters, give him the method ID, and give him its old state. And it's all state he gets from the configuration that we now extended. So each configuration also keeps the attacker state. And the resulting configuration is basically, I mean, you treat it as a, if you return from a function. You increase the program counter, you set the result register to the value that the attacker set, and um, you give it the new attacker state. And if the attacker reaches this result res with probability p, then your transition also has probability p to happen. Okay? So we also need another rule because we're concerned with indistinguishability. That means the attacker is at any point allowed to stop the execution and say, I'm, I know now that I was uh, communicating with the first program or the second program. So it, this is the same rule as before. The only difference is if his output has the form final and some other string, then we basically, the transition goes to configuration res, where no other rule applies. And we take this as his final guess. OK, so that's it. And with all these notions at hand, we can um, canonically define computational indistinguishability. So much about the technicalities that was necessary. Now, more interesting technicalities. So symbolic ADL, our symbolic variant of ADL, needs to satisfy the following conditions, as I said. We want original ADL whenever no crypto is involved. We want symbolic extraction if crypto is involved. We want the attacker as a set of symbolic rules. We don't want to change a single line, so only the semantics. And it's, well, we want it to be parametric in the symbolic model. And we want computation soundness. So what do we need? We need a symbolic model that is computationally sound in its own right. But I already talked about that. We take COSP as you remember probably. So now a more tricky part, how do we map Dalvik 
crypto libraries to terms. You might know that crypto libraries have different ways of specifying how um, a function is called. For example, the Javax crypto library does it as follows. You, have, uh, you first generate an instance and can dynamically decide which um, crypto primitive you want. Then you initialize it with a key length, then you um, generate the key. And what we basically do is we let the user of our result define a libspec function that takes a method ID, that takes an object instance, and that outputs a context on terms. So a function that takes zero or more arguments and outputs a term. And this libspec in this case would do nothing in the first, with the first two, um, first two instructions, but in the second instruction, it would generate SK of N1. And for the uh, next three instructions, it would again do nothing until it generates a fresh name, uh, nonce, nonce represent randomness. And now it becomes interesting. You uh, make a ciphertext instance, and you still do nothing. You um, run the initialization, and you still don't output anything in the libspec function. The only thing that changes is that the, um, the object instance now stores the keys and uh, other things in the heap. And now if you do final, you use this information that is in the, in the heap, and you output this function um, that takes a message and would output an encryption uh, term. So that's how we cope with um, different kinds of how, um, how crypto libraries want you to specify the cryptography, and we map it to these symbolic models. Okay, now the last thing, how do we, if we have a um, setting now where the values can be normal ADL values, so Dalvik values like pointers or numbers, how do we, and together with terms, how do we make a normal execution out of that? So what we do, the main idea is we decompose the normal semantics of ADL into three parts. I already suggested that in the different uh, depictions. What we do is we have, a, we have the attacker steps. We make this a sub-semantics, basically. We have the remaining steps, and we have the crypto steps. The crypto steps are the execution steps that the crypto library does, and the remaining steps are basically the ADL steps of the program that remain after we cut out these things. And this representation is independent of Dalvik, but we use it for um, Dalvik as well. But just to note, our proofs just work on this intermediate representation. So they are also applicable to other languages, potentially. So one other thing that I should mention, that the transitions, um, that each of these sub-semantics is independent of each other. The only thing that connects them are global transition functions. These are these delta HA, delta AH, and so on. And the only thing that they take is the previous state in the sub-semantics, so A, L minus one, for example, and explicit messages. The method ID here and some message M that is leaked to the attacker. We want to replace now these sub-semantics with, with a symbolic model that we got from COSP. So we cut out... Um, we cut out the execution steps for the attacker steps and for the crypto library and replace them with, replace them with um, the symbolic model. And here it was really important that we had these explicit global transitions. And otherwise we required that the um, sub-semantics are completely independent. Because now we can give the, arg the same arguments that the global transitions got, we can give to the symbolic model. As you can see, this is HM, MID, and M, as previously. And we have a way of continuing the execution after we um, get a result from the symbolic model because of these global transitions. So now the question is, how do we continue a normal execution if we have symbolic terms in the middle? And there, what we do is, um, the good thing is most rules are oblivious to reinterpretation of the domain. So whether we have terms, whether we have normal bit strings, whether you have a mix of both. If you move a message from one variable to the other, for example, nothing. Uh, it doesn't depend on the domain. 
Some rules, however, do depend on the domain, like a binary shift operation, operator. If we have a crypto library call and then we do a binary shift operation, then it's not clear what we, what we should do. So here again, that's what I said. If you have a um, call to a crypto library, you get a ciphertext back, which is a symbol, a symbolic term, which might have internally some other values, but it's on the outside, it also has symbolic terms. And now you want to shift the term five bits to the left. What do you do? Well, there are many smart things you can do. The thing what we do is we ask the attacker. This is a vast over approximation, we know, but um, it's better than previous work where you just excluded programs where this could happen. So um, here we, at least we contain the leakage to a small sub part of the program where this happens. Bart Jacobs has more smart ways to do this, and in the future we might adopt to them, but that's what we do in this work. And if no crypto messages are involved, then of course this rule is oblivious. Uh, no, we can just work on the normal values. And for those that are interested in the technical details, we represent the values in a symbolic way, but it's a symbolic bit strings, so we reconstruct all operations in a symbolic way. And don't forget, all of this is theoretical, so we don't need a program to do this. This is just to show that it is possible to do it, so we don't need to care about that. Okay, that's how we get a um, execution, and that's also where my talk basically concludes. This is all we need for the proof. And now, I will probably mo uh, lose most of you, but that's how the proof works. You start with ADL, Pi1 and Pi2 are two programs. You go to the split state semantics, for this you, do, uh, you use this lib spec function that I talked about. Then you over approximate and send uh, messages to the library that would not be able to cope with terms. Then you embed the over approximated semantics to COSP. And um, then the, the domain basically becomes references and um, yeah. There are no bit, bit strings involved anymore. Now you inline the symbolic model into the um, honest program semantics, as we have seen earlier. And the only thing that we additionally need to require is that the programs that you consider, except for the crypto library, do not consider probabilistic transitions. So you don't have something like I flip a coin and in half of the cases I go to the left branch and the other half to the right branch. Yeah, and then we get our result. So what we got is a symbolic variant as ADL of ADL. It can be a foundation that is amenable for formal methods. It is um, computationally sound in the sense that I described to you. And the interesting next steps are applications to formal methods. So what I'm most interested in is in um, extending IFC tools, information flow tools, as was announced initially, with crypto operations. The semantics that we have give a foundation to do that. And there are many challenges of how to do that, how to make it scalable and so on. And we have some ideas how to do it, but um, yeah, we would basically use a similar approach as Askarov with his cryptographically masked flows a few years back. And um, by that, hopefully achieve a more general way of including symbolic models into IFC verifications. Then what's also interesting is um, applying this to contract-based verification to check whether the specifications that are used are computationally sound and to use this for symbolic testing. That's also a possible way of extending this. Thanks for your attention. Okay, we have a room for several questions. Uh, okay, I guess I have some uh, questions to start. So, uh, my first question is like, can you uh, tell a little bit about, uh, or for example, like when you apply your uh, system on like difficult situations, I mean like obfuscated code, like reflections, I know like reflections is excluded uh, from your system, like do you have any alternative solutions and uh, like backup solutions? Do you mean if reflection occur in the program? Uh, reflection and maybe other obfuscations. Uh, yeah, this kind of situation. Okay. Um, so in principle, we do. You know, uh, you've seen that ADL, the language we are building on, does not include reflection. But if we had a language that included reflection, um, this is not a problem for us because we work on a dynamic level. 
And we basically change dynamically the execution to a symbolic execution. You can think of it as a, it's a uh, theoretical construction, but the theoretical construction takes the entire execution tree. So basically, it works dynamically. So there, obfuscation would not be a problem, reflection would not be a problem, because, uh, would not be a problem because we would see in the execution steps that something would be replaced, and then we would dynamically replace it with symbolic terms. Okay. Um. My, sex, my, my uh, second question is about like the uh, the usage of your your system. Uh, uh, it's, that's my feeling. It's like currently your uh, approach works with the cost. Like, uh, do you envision your component to work with like other like other systems, like other I don't know symbolic execution system? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in this result, we connected to cost. Is it possible to? We could reuse the ideas to connect to other um, systems. There's an interesting line of work uh, for by um, Common Lund and um, Bana, Gerge Bana, thanks. And um, they have a weaker, a weaker notion of computational soundness, where they, only, where they only have rules that can be abstracted. So in principle, we could also connect to such kind of work. And I'm in discussion with Gerge. Um, how we would do this, whether we can do it, and so on. That's uh, encouraging. And uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Okay, so I guess that.